Hello everyone, welcome back to the Orthopedic Tutor channel. Today we'll be discussing about the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but today our focus would be on the curve progression, evaluation, and also the comprehensive management plan. Now, the basics regarding this adolescent idiopathic scoliosis has been discussed in our previous video or the part 1 video. So now, let's get it on with the curve progression. Now, the very big question that always comes to our mind when patient comes to us with this type of condition is that will the condition progress because that is what the patient's parents would normally ask. Will my children's rib harm become bigger as she ages? Doctor, that is the most common question that they will ask. And you can answer that confidently when you have mastered this topic, which is the curve progression. So now, when the patient comes with an with a very young age with curve more than 20 degree or uh, the skeletal mature patient with curve more than 45 or to 50 degree the the curve will most likely progress now to predict how much the progression is we need to know how much the patient is still growing or how, what are the remaining skeletal growth that the patient has. There are several types to predict this. One is to predict using the peak height velocity method and the other would to be is to be using the RISA method. Now the first one would be the peak height velocity method. I'm going to show you this uh, schematic here. Sorry, I'm going to close the others first. Okay, so the first schematic here shown is the peak height velocity curve you can see here that at the height of the velocity uh, it is very closely related to the point of age where the three radiate cartilage of the pelvic is close and it is also very close to the age of risa one or risa two stage of the pelvic and you could also say that it is very close to the age of monarchy and that is why during physical exam you generally would ask the patient when is her menstrual periods and you would also take a pelvic radiograph to evaluate for the risa sign or also signs of tri radiate closure because if you see these signs then the patient has indeed gone through the phase of peak height velocity now the thing about peak height velocity is that it has a huge relation with the treatment plan because if you do a a fusion surgery or you put an instrument at the spine over at the posterior aspect and you put it at the edge before the peak height velocity the crankshaft phenomenon will occur as you can see the spine is growing anteriorly and posteriorly in an equal rate when you put an instrument over at the posterior aspect and lock them in position the anterior aspect of the spine will still grow and one day it will outgrow the posterior segment therefore reversing the curve and we call that as the crankshaft phenomenon but if you do a fusion posterior fusion surgery afterwards the phv moments then there shall be no crankshaft phenomenon now the best predictor to use is the age during the apophyseal closure of the maturity the male would be around 16 years old and the female would be around 14 years old this is an image of the three radiate cartilage this is the one with an immature type of three radiate cartilage and this one has fused completely the next would be the risa sign as you can see here this is the uh, apophysis of the patient you could see here that this is a growth plate and it goes from lateral to medial and as you can see here it progresses from stage one stage two stage three and until it reaches here becomes stage uh, stage five when the whole thing is gone so you can no longer see this black line here uh, so this is another image showing you the whole thing starting from stage zero as there's uh, only uh, barely there the lines the ossifications and the stage one goes here up to stage two stage three stage four it goes nearly towards the center and at stage five the whole thing completely fuses 
Now, it has also this peak height velocity also is related to the tenor stage. When the female, it is associated with tenor stage 2, and in the male, it is associated with tenor stage 2 or 3 or around 11 to 15 years old. Now, besides that, you could also do other me uh, measurements such as olecranon because as the as the growth center of the olecranon has closed, it correlates highly with the PHV. Other thing you could do is to use the Tanner White House radius ulna and short bones scoring system. And if the scoring system is up to three, where major majorities of the digits are already capped and the metacarpal epiphysis is wider, you could see here at the Tanner White House stage three, the metacarpal epiphysis is uh, quite wide, then you, it is correlated with the PHV. Now, the research sign, you probably have known it by now, uh, listening to the previous explanation. Now, how to, how to put to use this measurement of the research sign? So when you have a measurement of the research and you have determined the stage, whether it is a stage 0 or 1, you could correlate it with the patient's amount of curve. If the curve is still under 20 degree and you find the patient to have a research stage of 0 or 1, then the percentage of curve that will uh, the percentage of possibility of the curve to be to progress is only around 22 percent as opposed to when the curve reaches more than 20 degree in patients with research 0 or 1 there is a 68 percent of chance that the curve shall progress now knowing all that comes the next question how do you treat the patient now before we move on to all those detailed examination i would just like to show you this table here first this is a very good summary on regarding the things that could be done for patients in different stages of research sign and curve magnitude so basically when you find someone with a curve magnitude of less than 25 and you diagnose it with an idiopathic scoliosis all should be treated through observation only regardless of the stage of the uh, research and if you find the curve to be more than 45 degree, then regardless of the stage of RISA, you need to do a surgical type of treatment. Now, if you find the curve to be around 25 to 45 degree, then it, the, the, the treatment depends on the RISA sign. If the RISA sign shows that the patient has already matured or reached grade 3, 4, or 5, then you only need to do observation. But if the patient is still at grade 0 or pre stage or at grade 1 or 2 stage, then you need to do a brace therapy. Now next, we'll discuss about the non-operative treatment plan. The modalities varies, but you usually could do observation and bracing. Once again, the indications are as shown as the table earlier now you do observation in any patient that has a small curve which is a curve less than 20 to 25 degrees or in skeletally mature cases with curve less than 45 degrees that and is asymptomatic and you do that to go the goal of next treatment or bracing you do that to halt or slow progression in skeletally immature patient. So once again, you do not try to correct the patient's curve by using a brace that is applied forcefully, but you only do it to halt it or to slow the progression of the curve being to prevent it from getting bigger through time. Now the indications include curves with more than 20 to 25 degrees with progression or in very large curve in very immature adolescents. As we have discussed earlier, you cannot do anything invasive to a patient that is still very skeletally immature because you could induce a crankshaft phenomenon and things could go even worse. So the option should be bracing in very very immature adolescent with huge curves. Now, how do you do the follow-ups? The patients need to come to you very often and the patient needs to wear the brace for at least more than 12 hours a day. Uh, several papers have shown that the effectiveness of this brace is indeed dose dependent. So it all depends on how long the child wears the brace. Now, 
It is also shown in a study uh, involve, uh, involving around 1,900 patients that full-time bracing or more than 23 hours per day bracing is much better than part-time bracing or only around 8 hours per day. So your first follow-up should be around 2 to 4 weeks after you apply these types of brace to detect any discomfort and radiographs, uh, the first initial radiograph after the brace is being put on. The next follow-up depends on whether or not the patient is still in the rapid growth phase, which is around here, or if the patient has exit this area of rapid growth or around here. So if the patient is still in the area of rapid growth, you need to have the follow-up shortened. You need to follow up the patient for every four months. And if the patient has achieved the age of near maturity, you could do the follow-ups every six months. And you consider yourself as successful if you could see less than five degree curve progression during your follow-up. So when you do these follow-ups of around four to six months and you find that the degree is progressing to more or more than six degree or uh, sorry, more or exactly six degree, then you should discontinue your orthosis because it is not working well. Now, absolute progression is also absolute progression of the curve to reach a number of around 45 degrees is also an indication that your bracing has indeed failed. Now, you usually need to discontinue the use of this brace uh, in female population at around 18 to 20 months after the age of menarche or the age of research stage 4. As you know that when the patient has reached those level of research, the skeletal has reached maturity and therefore the curve should not be progressing. Now the, for the male counterparts, it is usually stopped during the racer grade 5. Now there are several different types of braces that you could use. Uh, one of it is the most commonly used is the Milwaukee or the Boston brace. You use Milwaukee brace or else otherwise known as the cervical thoracal lumbar uh, sacral orthosis when the curve it has an apex that is higher be, uh, above T8 but if you have a bra uh, curve apex of around T8 or below you need to use TLSO or thoracolumbar sacral orthosis the relative contraindication to use this if you have thoracic lordosis or hypokyphosis this is an example of the Boston brace here now the other types of brace that uh, could be worn is the Wilmington brace the Charleston brace as shown here this is a Charleston brace or even the Providence brace that is uh, being uh, made using a computer assisted design such as this one here you see that this is uh, custom made according to the body uh, you, you, we use a computer assistive design to help us determine the shape, size and also the magnitude of the brace itself. Now these bracings are usually generally uh, less effective in boys and those with overweight. Now the next thing you do is operative treatment if all of these non-operative treatment has failed and they have certain goals as to prevent curve progression it is also done to obtain fusion or to obtain and maintain your correction. Now for this operative means, the fusion levels uh, differs uh, according to your goals. Generally the goals is only to achieve good balance, whether it is a coronal balance or sagittal balance. Remember that you do not do fusion to correct the curve significantly, you just need to correct it to a point where the patient has balance of the spine, whether it is in the coronal or the sagittal balance. Now you do that through measurements as I have discussed in my previous video, the measurement for the coronal balance such as these and the sagittal balance taken from the center of C7 to the posterior superior edge of the S1 such as these. Now, 
Moving on, after you have known what your surgery is, you will need to know the general principles. So generally during surgery, you would want to include the structural curve or the largest curve. And you would like to include the non-structural curve into your fusion. If the non-structural curve has a high degree of more than 45 degree, or if there is significant rotation going on there. Now, to determine which part of the vertebrae is instrumented, one of the basic theories I find to be helpful is to learn where they, what type of Lenke curve they are in. So the upper instrumented uh, vertebrae or the most proximal vertebrae that it has implants on it, if the curve is over at the thoracic region, you usually put it over at the proximal end vertebrae only. And you usually fuse it up to the T2 level when you find one of these. The left shoulder has been elevated. There is T1 tilt that is greater than 5 degrees. The proximal thoracic curve has very significant rotation. And if there is transition curve or lengthy type 2 at T6 or below. For the thoracolumbar and lumbar curve, generally you place the most upper instrumented vertebrae over also at or the end vertebrae. Now for the lowest instrumented vertebrae, for the lanky A1 and 2 curve, for the A modifier, you usually put it to the vertebrae that is touched by the CSVL unless the L4 is tilted to the right. You need to fuse one to two levels distally. For the type B modifier, you usually fuse it proximal to the stable vertebrae and for the F to the stable vertebrae, sorry, and for the 1C modifier, you fuse it proximal to the stable vertebrae. For the rest of the lanky curve, you usually need to fuse it up to distal and vertebrae only. Now, there are various types of fusion technique that could be used and there are three uh, commonly known techniques which is the Harrington technique in which the fusion involves one level above and two levels below the end vertebrae if the, uh, the level falls within the stable zone. The next technique is the Mo technique where you fuse it up to the neutral vertebrae and in the Lenke technique you include all major curve in your fusion and you include minor curve that are not flexible and are kyphotic. Once again, when you fuse the structural curve and also the non-structural curve that is kyphotic or has significant rotation, we call this as the Lenke technique. Now for the technique itself, you could use posterior instrumentation and fusion. Generally, you would choose this one and you could also use the anterior instrumentation or fusion. This is very uncommon, but it is useful in single thoracic fusion in patients with hypokyphosis or single thoracolumbar lumbar fusion. Now, these are the more commonly used technique, anterior and posterior, if you do it, you do a surgery in a very young patient to prevent the crankshaft phenomenon. If you do it in a case where the three radiate cartilage is still open or in the age population before the peak height velocity and you also do it to prevent crankshaft phenomenon. Now what happens after this? Afterwards you need to know the prognosis of the condition because there is an increased incidence of acute or chronic pain if this AIS condition is indeed left untreated and if the curve has progresses to up to more than 90 degree then it could induce cardiopulmonary dysfunction decreased self image including it is the uh, cause, uh, one of the cause of early death and also pain now for the complication itself there are various complications that occur after the surgery which includes post-operative drainage which could occur from the wound of your surgical wound, it cause it could also be complicated by hardware failure or flat back syndrome. There could also be crankshaft phenomenon, and you usually need to avoid this by doing anterior disectomy and also anterior fusion besides the posterior fusion. Now, pseudoarthrosis is common. It could occur to up to three percent of population, and usually it is gen it is associated with pain and it is also associated with fractured rod. Now, the thing you need to do to manage this is to use compression type of instrumentation along with grafting. Now, infection rate, acute infection is usually caused by the Staphylococcus aureus and drainage, and you need to do 
uh, antibiotic administration until fusion has been achieved. While for the chronic counterpart, the infection is usually caused by other subtypes of uh, bacteria, which includes the P. agnes bacteria and also the epidermidis. And you need to do implant removal in these cases because you need to evaluate the pseudoarthrosis furthermore and you need to treat the infection until it is done. Now, neurologic deficits can also occur, but nowadays this is very rare with all sorts of intraoperative neuro. Uh, intraoperative monitoring of the spinal cord function this is very rare nowadays but there it could still sometimes happens and there could it could be a nerve root problem or it could even be an incomplete SCI which could be related to the misplaced implant as we know that the scoliosis the, the vertebrae that has scoliosis within the shape and normal anatomy of it is slightly distorted it could have a slightly shorter or longer uh, pedicles it could also be bent and therefore sometimes the pedicle screw could breach the pedicle walls and therefore be contact be in contact with the spinal cord and causing irritation and all sorts of disruption but sometimes it also could be vascular related so during surgery the prolonged surgery or the bleeding that occurs intraoperative could cause hypoxia and damage to the spinal cord itself now, that will be all for today's discussion regarding the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, be sure to check out my first video once again if you are confused with all these theories because this th needs to be studied slowly and you need to understand all the basic concepts before you go on to the management plan. For more educational videos, don't forget to check out my orthopedic tutor channel and please subscribe if you like it. Thank you.